So the next thing I want to mention is another way to exploit this idea of magnetic susceptibility. Again, to get some physiologic information out of our images. And this is what we typically call functional MRI. So how many people here are familiar? You've heard the term fMRI, you guys? You know, have you seen any of these studies, fMRI studies? Yes? Yeah? On 60 Minutes? OK. <laughs> it's better than nothing. <laughs> Okay, so conceptually, an fMRI, this is a topic, on, we could spend weeks talking about this. So again, I just want to give you a conceptual idea of what's involved in doing an fMRI study. This is something we do in clinical practice, uh, specifically also in evaluating preoperative patients. It's also a major research tool, obviously. And we have people in the room who are more expert than I in, uh, in functional imaging. But to give you a sense of what we're talking about, if we have our patient and we think about the brain, most of you are probably aware of the fact that the brain is functionally subspecialized, meaning that when you do a certain task, Right, if I tap my fingers together, that there are specific regions of my brain that are involved in, so to speak, conveying the instruction set to my hand, to my muscles, to be able to do that. And to look at this in what is admittedly a crude, a crude manner, there would be a region right, in the precentral gyrus of the frontal lobe, primary motor cortex, that would be involved in the motor control of these fingers. When I move these two fingers, the neuron populations in that part of my brain, in order for me to do that, have to increase their rate of functioning. They increase their both triggering of action potentials. This probably has more to do with subthreshold activity in those neurons. But suffice it to say that there is an increase in neuronal activity. And that neuronal activity does not come at no cost. Right? In order to continue to do this, these neurons require that they be supplied an additional amount of their metabolic substrates, right? glucose and oxygen, principally. So the brain has a great system that when I do this and I tap my fingers together, there is that increase in metabolic demand, which is met by a vascular response, or what we call a hemodynamic response, which means that at that point in time, there is going to be an increase in the blood supply to that local area of the brain, as opposed to other locations. So on my motor strip, right, we all know that things are specialized for leg, arm, face, so the specific portion of my motor strip that is representing my finger activity is going to receive this additional blood supply and let's say the adjacent areas from my other fingers or from my leg or my face are not. So it's a localized response. Now we already said that if we have blood which is deoxygenated, right? If our hemoglobin is stripped of its oxygen molecules, that this is a paramagnetic substance. And that on the other hand, oxygenated hemoglobin is a diamagnetic substance. <coughs> that these two substances have different effects on the MR signal that specifically deoxygenated hemoglobin causes a decline in the MR signal because it is a, has a high magnetic susceptibility. In this scenario where there is an increase in blood supply to that part of the brain, 
we can actually watch over time at the concentration of oxygenated and deoxygenated hemoglobin. Right? So if we plot right on the y-axis here the ratio of oxygenated to deoxygenated hemoglobin, there is some baseline concentration when I'm at rest and admittedly this is all a simplification but it conveys the basic message. At the point in time <clears throat> at which there starts to begin that metabolic demand due to neuronal activity in this location, the first thing that is going to happen is that the tissue begins to extract an increasing amount of oxygen from the bloodstream, which means that this ratio of oxy to deoxyhemoglobin actually declines. Very shortly thereafter, there is this increase in blood supply to that location which will cause an increase in that oxygenated deox to deoxygenated hemoglobin because that's oxygenated arterial blood that's being supplied. And that response actually surpasses the amount required to get back to this baseline such that the ratio of oxy to deoxyhemoglobin increases above the initial baseline. And at some point if we stop that activity, this will decline eventually to baseline. The period of time to sort of get to this peak is somewhere on the order of several seconds. Whereas this initial little dip in this oxy to deoxyhemoglobin ratio persists for a very brief period of time. Okay. Now if we think about this ratio of oxygenated to deoxygenated hemoglobin, how could that potentially affect the MR signal? Well, if we have more oxygenated than deoxygenated hemoglobin, will that make the signal higher or lower? Higher. And at this point in time, when we extract oxygen from the bloodstream and we have more deoxygenated hemoglobin, the MR signal would actually decline. And then as we increase our blood supply, there is more and more oxygenated hemoglobin, which will cause the signal to rise again. So we can actually look at this in terms of the signal intensity on an image that is sensitive to this effect. And that, of course, would be an image sensitive to T2 star. So if we were able to image at very high temporal resolution, during this process, we could actually detect this change in signal if we measured it at this location in the brain. If simultaneously we looked at some other area, let's say in the temporal lobe, that's not related to this process of my tapping my fingers, if there is an area that's not related, we would not see this at all. Right? In this other area, we would detect just a flat baseline. Okay? The magnitude of that difference right, is in proportion to the hemodynamic response providing this additional blood supply. Right? This is how we do functional imaging of the brain. If we image a slice of the brain or several slices of the brain, we can essentially plot this type of a curve for each and every voxel in the entire brain. And we can then ask the question that if we know that during this period of time this is when the activity, the finger tapping was taking place, we can say which voxels show a signal change that is consistent with the beginning and ending of this finger tapping and which voxels do not. And we could generate an image where we can encode the pixels in the image with the statistical probability that that's the case. And end up drawing a little region in the right, motor strip in this example that tells us that this is the location to the exclusion of all others where there was
a change in signal that correlated with the temporal pattern, the beginning and ending time of our task or stimulus. Okay? And that's how it's done. Now, the only thing that you need to keep in mind is two things. First of all, the initial effect here, this little dip in that signal, is of such brief duration and is of such small magnitude, this is not drawn to scale, that for our purposes, right, at the types of field strengths that we're imaging most human subjects, it's not detectable. Right? And when we talk about functional MRI, the effect that we are detecting is this increase in signal, which occurs at a right, delay after the onset of the stimulus. So I start tapping my fingers, and even if I could image at an infinitely high temporal resolution, you know, every five microseconds, there would be a period of time until I could detect this increase in signal. All right? That's number one. Number two is that if we look at how big this signal change is. How much do you think the signal actually changes in the brain when I tap my fingers like that? A guess? It's a couple of percent. It's a couple of percentage points of signal change. It's a very small signal. It's proportional to field strength. So as we go to higher and higher field strength, the absolute magnitude of that signal gets greater. But we're talking about you know, maybe in the order of 2 to 3 percent at most. It varies from brain region to brain region, from task to task, but it's a very small effect. Acquiring a bunch of images while I do this one time is not enough information for us to be able to do this, to make this kind of a measurement. And what we end up needing to do is to image for a very long period of time, relatively long period of time, where we alternately have the subject perform whatever the task is, maybe the finger tapping in this example, with intervening periods of time where they don't do anything. So we now have this long series of images and what we can do is make a model of what we would expect the signal amplitude to do. That at some delay following this onset of task, we would expect there to be an increase in signal and that it would decline. It's also going to take some time for it to fall off even after, after they stop the task. And then it will come back up again, etc. And we can make a comparison between this model and the actual signal changing in real time at every voxel in the brain. And based on the correlation between what we expect to happen and what actually happens, we can determine the voxels that are involved in that task. So the reason why we would bother to do this is that this can be very useful information, again, in, as a clinical example in pre-surgical planning. If a patient is going to have surgery, and let's say they're going to have part of their temporal lobe removed because of uh, intractable epilepsy, so we know that language localizes to the temporal lobe in part. The surgeon would like to know where those language areas begin and end in the temporal lobe prior to doing the surgery to first of all make an assessment as to whether it's likely that they could do enough surgery, enough of a resection to help the clinical problem, the epilepsy, but not leave the patient with a language deficit. So doing this type of a study using, instead of finger tapping, using a task that elicits brain responses related to language, we can actually map out these functional regions. Right, any questions about this? Nothing? Okay. So this is what it looks like. This is an example where we had the patient wear a pair of goggles that just flashed some LEDs in both of their eyes, which we expect to give a large response in primary visual cortex. This is an image 
from that long time series when the stimulus was turned off. And this image is when it was turned on. Can you see the huge difference in signal? Right, you can't see it. It's such a small effect. I mean, we could hallucinate that maybe it looks a little higher over here, but this is not something you can detect by visually looking at the images. You have to make that statistical comparison and here, superimposed on their other T1 weighted image from their brain that we acquired at the same time, the yellow pixels are just showing you the locations where there was a significant correlation between the onset of the stimulus and the response. This is showing you the actual MR signal from that same case, from visual cortex. So you can see that, ooh, looks like our key didn't show up, but if you look at this signal, we can see that there are increases, decreases, increases, decreases, and it's a pretty noisy looking signal, which is why we need to do this over such a long period of time to have enough statistical power to be able to infer anything meaningful. And you know, you can make this like everything else into these nice 3D renderings where you incorporate the function, which is what you're showing in color. This is from a language task in a patient that was pre-op for a tumor resection, actually, where we incorporate the functional information in color with the anatomy to give us a, a better look at exactly where it is.